So this is where we get a little bit into social media and uh, it's, it, it's, it's no unknown to anybody today. I, I don't think we have anybody in this group at least who does not use social media um, in one form or the other. I mean, even WhatsApp or WeChat or uh, of course, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, they're all, all part of uh, social media. Uh, quickly, um, what is social media? It's, it's, a, it's a set of tools or it's a series of tools which are used to create, share and exchange uh, um, content and content can be textual, audio, uh, it can be video, it can be photographs uh, and so on. Uh, the key what that makes social media extremely powerful is uh, its its ability to allow two-way interaction uh, and its ability to build a stronger, larger virtual community, uh, which would have taken so much more effort and resources to make it uh, physically. Uh, and then most importantly, I think we've seen many places where governments get changed or governments get elected. Uh, because of the power of social media or communication through social media. It's in one way, it has provided a loudspeaker to every person. On the other hand, it has provided access to information uh, and interaction. And of course, there's a lot of abuse and misuse. Uh, we're not even getting there. Uh, but uh, on that point, I just wanted to quickly run a short uh, um, Whiteboard uh, exercise here, in your opinion, uh, one or two words at a time, maybe, uh, what can social media be used for? And that's a very good point where Matt's coming back, yay. <laughs> right, so if you could share your um, ideas and understandings about what all social media can uh, be used for. Yeah, Joanna, can you please share more about it? I don't know about this, uh, put a tiger in your tank. Okay, uh, entertainment, I'll just start annotating. Entertainment, awareness, uh, spreading a message. <laughs> Fundraising, good point, Nilofer. Petitions, fantastic. Uh, learning new skills. Knowledge sharing, uh, right. Uh, creating community ask for action engage with stakeholders Nah. Yeah, I have a few listed here as well. Uh, if I can quickly read out, maybe these are out of place, but they also, social media also helps build a credible reputation, I think. Uh, what you communicate, how you communicate, um, I think these over time help people see a certain organization or an individual, because it doesn't matter. It could be an organization or an individual out on social media. And these do end up building a credible reputation. Um, so uh, have virtual community. Yes, we have added that. Thank you, Chimmy. Uh, citizen science, excellent. Throwing light on some issue. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And uh, da, 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 da. Okay, yeah. And then there is this tiger in your tank conversation. Right. So I think you guys have really pointed up. Maybe do you do you guys agree if I can say that it helps uh, uh, build a credible reputation? Because believe it or not, and this was a very recent thing I, I, I learned from another workshop on social media where they were saying that, believe it or not, uh, whenever you're posting on social media, think of it as your boss is always watching. If not your current boss, then your future boss is always going to watch. Uh, and, and it turns out that almost all uh, recruiters tend to, uh, if not all, then most recruiters tend to find out more about potential candidates on social media. So I think if you're on social media, you're exposing yourself uh, to, an, uh, to, the, to the entire world out there, which is why it's also a very important point, uh, maybe I think to, to, to build a credible reputation. Um, every other point I had written down Maybe product sales. Uh, some organizations also have, use it for product sales. So we can put that there. Uh, donors, we have already, fundraising is already there. Mm, drive, uh, publicize, publicize events. Uh, diversify audience, another point. Yes, marketing, good choice. Product sales and marketing, I think that should be all right. Flavia, if you're okay. Um, sorry, Harshad, I missed that point. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, Justine. <laughs> I don't think you'll need to worry about that one. I, I believe you don't need to worry on that front. <laughs> but future boss, who never, you never know, right? <laughs> so keep that in mind. Uh, anyway, so, right. So that's, that's roughly what we have, uh, you know, what social media can be or is used for. Matt, you're back. I'm just going to pass the baton to you after uh, this one, if you're okay. Sure. Um, let me see. Maybe... I'm going to share my screen in that case, because I, I added a couple of slides to of what you had created. So I'm clearing and uh, handing over to Matt. Ooh, OK. <laughs> Let me see. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Oh, no, no longer. OK. Now we see your colleague's Skype yeah. message. <laughs> OK, here we go. Hopefully, we're now back on PowerPoint. Yes, we are. We see, right. We see PowerPoint. So, I, I at the risk of sounding like a broken record, but I keep coming back to to the same thing. I mean, social media can be powerful tools, but they really only become powerful or can unlock their potential if you take the time to create a content strategy of of some sort. Essentially, it's about defining which strategic goals you want to achieve through your social media communications and you know it doesn't mean every single post has to always necessarily directly be related to that but your overall um, philosophy of what you post when you post and how you post should follow a goal ideally and the goal that you define it should never be i want a thousand likes and five thousand followers or a million followers because these at the end of the day they're vanity metrics they they can help in some cases, you know, funders sometimes might be impressed if you can say we have a million people on your on our Facebook that will see this content. But even then, if you if you think about when you promise your 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 million followers as an audience to a funder, you're also exposing yourself to a certain risk because then you you have to post about your funder. And depending on who that funder is, it might not that might not work so well with with your other strategic goals. So yeah, there is value in having a large number of followers, but usually that value is not in and of itself, but it's because you want to achieve something. So the next step is in, in this in this kind of coming up with the content strategies, what are the actions that you would like your audience to take? Um, we've talked about this a lot today because awareness alone usually isn't the goal but the goal is for for that awareness to lead to some other kind of activity hi tanaya see you there in the background um and 
essentially what, what you when you think of what action you want your audience to take that action leads to an outcome it leads to some form of change that you have thought about that you would like to achieve or it helps contribute towards that change um, just some examples we've mentioned throughout the course of this of these sessions um, we I think this was brought up by Sibylla in the first session the the campaign Snow Leopard Trust had um, six seven years ago now to get products made of endangered species banned from Etsy which was largely social media driven it was a petition campaign um, that get, got the support eventually of outside actors like Care2 and others for this kind of thing you know a big social media audience is fantastic because it it really it galvanizes them it's an action they can take it's a small action it leads to change the change being no more sonic products or tiger products on etsy um the thing we talked about earlier today achieving higher protection for tossed can be something where a social media campaign is useful as an as an outcome or collecting signatures to send support to the GSLAB conference so these kinds of things can be examples of, of the kind of change that you want to see and that your social media content strategy contributes to. What this is tied to, and I think this is sort of the theme of the of the of the entire session today, is is what is your theory of change really? Um, what's the problem you're trying to address? What are the drivers of this problem that you're trying to address? And then once you've identified that mapping out the different stakeholders involved the reasons these stakeholders have for engaging in problematic behavior whether that's you know profit whether it's need whether they maybe often they have no other choice you know if the problematic behavior is retaliation killings for instance the reason for that is usually that there isn't they don't see another opportunity another alternative to it the the people who do these killings once you've understood why the problem happens, the next step is what can be done to maybe change it. So what are the what are the interests or needs of, of your of your stakeholders? Now, if, if your stakeholder is a big company that's in it to make a profit, it's a very different approach than if your stakeholder is a local community member that's just trying to survive. If it's a company, for instance, their need might be a good image. And if that's the case, you can use that need as a pressure point. You can direct your activity, your campaign towards either you know, making their image a little bit less good unless they change or giving them an opportunity to improve their image by changing proactively. All of this basically helps you determine how you can use your communications tools to support and drive change. Um, at this point, Kostub, I think it would be great if you could go back to screen sharing because then I can access some of the notes I have to speak about the f about the next couple of slides. Is that okay? I think we've lost Kostub, maybe. No, you haven't lost me. I'm sorry. Okay. I, okay. I'm sorry. Could you could you go back to your uh, to your screen and the presentation yes. on your screen? I will hold on. Thank you. Just a second. Mm. Oh no, I closed it. We get to the Twitter page, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. mm. Share screen. Oh, there. Okay. Can you guys see the screen now? Hello? Yeah. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. We could see it. Now it's back. Yeah, now, yeah. Um, so let, let's take a few minutes to just speak briefly about the main social media channels and kind of what they're good for and do's and don'ts that apply on these channels. I think that's a valuable thing to do. How many of you are active on Twitter, either yourselves personally or through a organizational account? Uh, 
I know Kostub and Tristine are quite active. I know um, Rocky is on Twitter. And could so, some of you who are on Twitter, could you also just put in the chat or, or speak about it? Just sort of the main reasons why you use Twitter. Just give me a second, I'm changing the screen so it's clearly visible. No worries. I'm already seeing some, some good reasons coming in. And I think it's it really covers what, what I would also say um, for instance, Nilo first has get updates on new publications. I think Justine, you also said mostly about professional contacts, make information available. And that, that really, I think, hits it on the head. Um, Twitter is, is a very good tool to communicate with your peers, be that in science, be it in, in, in media, whichever, whichever your field is. It is also a very good tool to communicate with journalists. If, um, if that's something some of you may be looking for. A lot of journalists, for instance, are on Twitter and have their direct messages open. Um, normally, if, you, you know, if you're a private Twitter user, most of us have their settings so that you can only message me if I follow you. But a lot of journalists have that open so that anyone who has a, a tip or a, you know, a story to pitch can actually get in touch with them. So I, I find in my in my job that's a big part of what I do. So I find it very useful to do that. Twitter can also be useful to communicate with sort of niche communities. I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, at Snowleopard Trust, at some point we started seeing a lot of engagement on on tweets from the the online furry community um, i don't know if, if everyone's familiar with with what the furry community is but at the risk of, of not doing them justice at all essentially it's a group of people who who have sort of animal alter egos and they wear these kind of fursuits and meet in their in their animal alter egos as a, as a community and among them are quite a lot of people whose alter ego is a snow leopard and so at, at one point this engagement, you know, they started liking, retweeting, and, and we got in touch with, with some of the of the people leading in that community and, and started conversations with them. And it eventually led to them organizing a fundraiser for Snow Leopard Trust within their community, which was really successful. They raised quite a lot of money and they're they're still very engaged with um with the content. And I think that connection and uh, what's been built on top of it would not have happened outside of a, of a channel such as Twitter, where you can really, you know, like-minded people from different parts of the world and from different sort of social scenes can find each other and, and really interact. And that's, it's still to this day, one of my favorite examples of a Twitter engagement interaction that, um, that led to something productive and, and, and really nice. So if we if we go back to the to the slide that Kostub had up, where it's uh, kind of do's and don'ts to be very to do to do very practical things, I can just share a few points, and maybe maybe the whiteboard is the best place to to put them at the end. Matt, do you guys see the screen? Uh, give me a moment. I see the whiteboard. Oh yes, I said. Oh, you've put them there. Sorry, I didn't realize that. Ah. Sorry, that's great. <laughs> I wasn't sure because it's, it it's, it's more it's almost more like reasons to use it that we've put up rather than yeah. ways to do it. But that's fine. I think we can use the same. Uh, so one thing that's important if you do use Twitter 
is to to use it regularly keep posting ideally you would want to post several tweets a day but but at least one or so each day and make it and that's true for all social media but twitter even more than than maybe other channels it should never be a one-way street um any any successful social media engagement on twitter is really a conversation meaning you if you want to be there you engage in relevant conversations you retweet people you comment on if you're just putting out information and you see sometimes corporate accounts with you know a lot of followers but they themselves don't follow anyone that's really not what twitter was built for and that's not where it's strong where its strong points are if you if that's what you want to do i am I, mean, I wouldn't i wouldn't stop you from doing it but I would advise that you consider whether it's the best use of your resources to just use it as a as a channel from which you can blast your messages out. Because you can do that, but it the way Twitter and all these platforms work is it, it also sort of punishes you for that. If there's little engagement, if you don't if you don't react to comments, for instance, if you if you don't follow up on things, if you never comment on other people's content your content will eventually stop showing up in people's timelines because they they their algorithm identifies you as not an engaged participant but rather just a you know a source of of information and that they try to to disincentivize this so i would really advise you if you're if you do invest into in twitter you have to do it in a in a way where it's really a regular tool of exchange that you um that you use this is also connected to reputation risks. If you're on Twitter and people criticize you or make, you know, make comments about on a post of yours that are inappropriate or ask you questions, even, you know, innocent positive questions. If you then don't react, if you leave if you leave bad comments on without a response, if you leave questions without a response, if people People criticize you and there's no follow-up from from your side you don't look very good I mean, at best you don't look professional at worst you look like you're hiding something so if you do use the tool be sure that you're ready to use it and re being ready to use it means you you have to be ready to engage with what's going on and there's a lot a lot more points here but i think we can um these are the key things to to be aware of so i would suggest that we move on to the next one which is instagram same here i would be very curious to hear from people who use instagram and especially if you use it in a professional context so not not just as your personal you know, network to engage with your friends how you do it and, and why you do it. There's a lot of interesting stuff coming in. So one one point I would really like to talk more about is um, what Nilo Far wrote about getting in touch with rangers and locals in the context of Iran, because that just personally I find that very interesting. Um, Kostub, you had asked, does that hold true for trolls? Is this in response to Twitter comments?
Yes, Matt. Uh, you you mentioned right that you know if someone's asking you a question or criticizing you, uh, you must respond. I would just uh, just just wanted to ask what's your opinion. But there are times you have trolls who are right, right, just to run you down. Basically, there's there's no other purpose there. Yeah, I mean, and we, how do we, we had, define the difference? We had some trolls ourselves at the start of this session. I think that I'm sure would fit, we did. Would fit yes. the definition. <laughs> you still you still react. And the reaction might just be to block them or to shut them down. Uh -huh. What you don't want is to is for them to just take over the space and without Makes you sense. having any kind of response. Maybe your response can just be one comment saying, like, you know, we. Um, it, it seems clear that you're not interested in actually engaging with the content. So you know, we but but say something. Of course, yeah. if you have millions of trolls, it, it might be different, but most of us aren't in that luxurious situation. True, true. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, all right. So most of the things that are coming in for Instagram are sort of the way I would see it. It's a, it's a very strong medium for visual storytelling. It's a, it's a great medium to take people sort of behind the scenes, for instance. Um, think of Instagram stories, which a lot of people, you know, is one of them actually have, have used very effectively to, to show a different side of the work. You could, for instance, use your Instagram feed to post beautiful pictures, but then use the stories to, to post short video clips of, you know, how you do the work, how you speak with local community members, how you set up camera traps, that sort of thing to give people Kind of a closer look at, at what's going on that's something i found very interesting um Nilufar, if you don't mind would you would you just share a, a few thoughts on how you use instagram in specifically to to talk to rangers and locals because i think that's something i haven't really heard so far Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, thank you, Matt. Uh, Matt. It's really interesting that in Iran, uh, many of rangers and locals are using Instagram to share their uh, photos and videos of wildlife. So this is a really great platform to get in touch with them, uh, repost and uh, share uh, their content, uh, which is really, really important and motivating for so many of them. So we found it as a really powerful way to first of all, get in touch with them. And uh, second, uh, uh, in, in so many cases, ask them uh, to take an action or, or probably uh, get involved them in a part of our projects. For instance, uh, and now uh, we use um, a page on Instagram to raise aware awareness on small cats, uh, study and conservation. So we found that so many rangers are approaching us to share their uh, footages of small cats in their uh, in the protected areas that uh, they work, uh, and uh, we can also um, ask them that if they are interested, we can have some workshops for them uh, to probably let them know how they can um, uh, get in, uh, you know, get involved in small cat conservation, the monitoring uh, techniques, and so many different things which is going on on Instagram for us. So this is really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. This is, I've never heard of, of you know, this kind of way of using Instagram really, but I think it's great. And it's something that I would be very curious to see if in other countries it's similar, you know, if, if rangers and, and local people are using Instagram in, in such a way. Because if they are, it's it's a fantastic tool to build relationships with them, but also share their work with the rest of the world and the rest of your of your audiences. So that I think that is really really cool, and I would encourage everyone to see how the situation is in in your country. And if it's not Instagram, what is the medium that people are using? Because a lot of this stuff, you know, is from the perspective of someone in Europe working at least for a time in, in snow leopard countries. But as we see, it's very different in, in different regional contexts. 
One thing that's maybe good to know about Instagram for those who aren't as familiar with it is I find it a less effective tool for, for fundraising and, and for other sort of, you know, petition based public advocacy campaigns for the, for the main reason that you can't really post links. They have, you know, they've come up with some ways to to get work around that but it's still it's still somewhat limited that from a post you cannot directly click on a on a donation page on a on a shop or any other outside platform and so you you have a bigger jump for people to make from from the channel they're in let's say they're in the instagram app on their phone the jump for them to go and do something else on a, in a different platform is much much bigger because they have to actively seek it out so in that sense it's uh it's maybe not as good and as effective a tool for for these purposes than other tools are um justine can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by less sensitive the instagram audience is being less sensitive um sure uh i just mean that we've when we've often post the same thing for slt on instagram facebook and twitter sometimes uh twitter modified slightly uh the reactions on facebook um tend to be much more uh sensitive in terms of uh, if there's a collared cat if there's anything related to poaching anything related to threats um people react very negatively very quickly uh with instagram uh there's more questions are asked maybe more informed questions. I don't know if that's related just to the audience um, of SLT's uh, audience for Instagram and Facebook. Um, just a reminder, though, if uh, Kustub and Matt, if you guys could wrap up in the next five minutes or so, just um, uh, Raki was writing to me. Sure. No, we're, I think we're, we're almost done. We, we have one more slide, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> But it's it's definitely it's definitely true that the audiences of these platforms are quite different um and instagram is a younger crowd i think instagram is has has replaced facebook as as the the medium of choice for let's say people under 30 and maybe even slightly older than that whereas facebook has really become the platform where your grandma and your aunt are active with you know the good and the bad that that brings and it's definitely also true that your individual audiences are not they're not all the same and you know sniper trusts facebook audience for instance is is very skewed towards people who just find animals cute and who are very sensitive to issues such as poaching or even working with animals rather than sort of leaving them alone and I think that has a lot to do with, because for, for, for a long time, the strategy in, in Facebook at SLT was to grow a big audience and to engage that audience in fundraising, in, in buying Snow Leopard t-shirts or handicrafts, every now and then signing petitions. So it's, it's a different type of crowd because of the, the way the platform has been used to the Instagram um, crowd in my opinion and I think we we can go to the last slide which is about Facebook And we've we've actually covered a lot of this already in the in the conversation. I think Facebook is kind of the the granddad of social networks, both in terms of how long it's been around and in terms of the audience. I guess it's definitely a, a platform that's for more of a mass audience. It's not. It's often not an audience that's deeply engaged with content. It's very much, as Flavia mentions, it's very much become polarized. It's, I think it's always been, but it's gotten worse for sure in the last couple of years. For instance, to Justine's earlier point, in, in Facebook, on Sniper Trust Facebook, we would often see very insensitive, sometimes racist, sometimes really horrible comments. You know, like if, if you post something about 
retaliatory killings or or even about poaching you would have the kinds of comments where entire populations of countries were were called barbarians because of just having different customs than than what people are used to so it's it's really become in some in some ways a bit of a i don't want to say a minefield but a a difficult platform to to manage because you also obviously have great audiences there who are very positively engaged but it's it's really also become a bit of a dumping ground for for people's um i guess problems one thing that i have found interesting on on facebook is if you use it more specifically for groups um, so for instance snow leopard trust has a facebook group not a page but a group where you have to apply to be a member that's only for regular donors and that group is really great because it, these are highly highly engaged people who are not just engaged with the topic but with the organization they've donated over and over and over again and the group is maybe 100 people and it's a very positive sort of engagement and it's mostly mostly audience driven so the content shared there isn't shared by snow leopard trust usually but it's the members of the group who post articles about snow leopards that they've seen somewhere or um you know pictures that they've come across and it's very limited of course but it's a very good tool to keep these people engaged and to give them a platform and a channel to to communicate among each other and to to share their passion for for snow leopards and that that i think has been has been really cool and it's something that i would encourage you to to look into if you have a a group of say 20 plus people that you know are very very engaged to provide something like that it can also be a very useful tool for for fundraising for petitions all of those kinds of things as long as you are aware that you know the effort you put in and what you get out of it might not always be aligned so much um it's been a while that i've used it for those purposes but when i did up to about two years ago facebook would typically make up about maximum 10 percent of donation revenue that's not a trust brought in and by donation revenue i mean donations from individual people rather than foundations um, grants etc so the vast majority still came in through other channels such as email but it's not it's not negligible you can use facebook for um for fundraising and for for the kind of advocacy where it's about people signing a petition making a click or two if that's something that is a big goal of yours absolutely invest in facebook but building a, a big audience just to have people click like on a picture and make an insensitive comment might not be worth it for everybody and i think that takes us to the end of the of the slides and to discussions for anyone who has questions and has points that they would like to bring up